You can either write a play or you can't write a play. It's like running four minutes a mile. You can either do it, you can't. Welcome to The River Has No Fear of Memories, a series of conversations with Girish Karnad. This podcast is brought to you by the Bangalore International Center. My name is Arshia and I'm here with Anmol. We recorded these conversations with Girish right before his death in June 2019. In these episodes, we have a chance to listen to Girish's wide-ranging observations about his life and his work. Along with excerpts from his plays, we'll hear various people talk about his legacy as an artist and as a public intellectual. Girish Karnad was so many things. He wore so many hats. For some people, they remember him as an actor, as a movie star. Other people think of him as a filmmaker, and some others think of him as, as, as a public intellectual. But if you asked him who he was, he would always unequivocally say, I am a playwright. But that wasn't always the case. He became a playwright. And in this episode, we'll talk about how he became one. I must tell you that when I wrote my first play, it just came. I wanted to be a poet and I wanted to be a poet in English, you know, and I wanted to be with the Nobel Prize winner. This was all part of the agenda, you know, and, uh, you know, I wanted to be, I could, I could almost see W.B. Yeats, T.S. Eliot, W.H.R. and Girish Karna. You know, that, that, kind of, that, that was the uh, image one carried. And, um, and suddenly, one day I wrote, and wrote a play in Canada. You know, this 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 was the another turning point. It completely astounded me because I didn't think I was a playwright. I didn't think I wrote in Canada. Wanted to write Canada, and I was not interested in mythology. It was part of my growing up, but you know, it was Yayati the play, and I wrote the play, and it had five female characters, four female characters. And no one touched it with a barge pool. You know, for six years, nobody did my first play. Let's listen to two of these women characters, Devyani, Yayati's queen, and Sharmishta, her former friend and now a slave. This is from the beginning of Yayati, which was published in Canada in 1961. Malikar Prasad voices Devyani, and Lekha Naidu plays the role of Sharmishta. I feel sorry for you. I've often thought of sending you back home, but there is no way you can force me to do so. And this certainly is no way. I promise you, madam, I was not being deliberately nasty. It's just that I'm an uncouth Rakshasi. And the situation here, a Kshatriya palace ruled over by a Brahmin queen, confusing isn't the word. Don't you ever tire? The same old stings, the blunted barbs, they don't even hurt anymore. But what have you got against that poor Swarnalata? Or His Majesty? Attack me, do your worst, I don't care. But this is between us. Leave the others out of it. Others. There are no others. There is only the two of us here. You, my respected mistress, and me, your favorite slave. Entwined, lacerating each other, gouging each other's eyes out. 
The others are there because they happen to be there. I didn't ask them in. Incidentally, I'm told, actually I wasn't told since no one here talks to me, but I gather that your prince is expected to arrive this evening with his new bride. I can bear... Don't, don't you dare touch them. Can't you see you're only hurting yourself? Can't you see the futility of it all? Why don't you just open your eyes and see? I opened my eyes two years ago. Don't you remember? I do. The precise moment. When I closed my eyes, I was the princess of the Rakshasas. And you were the offspring of a destitute Brahmin dependent upon my father. I had everything. Beauty, education, wealth. Everything except birth. And Arya pedigree. What was your worth? That your father knew the Sanjeevani spell? That is all. Yet, I worshipped you. No, I loved you. To me, the most wondrous power I possessed seemed to be my ability to shower gifts upon you. Things you hadn't asked for, but which you so gracefully accepted. My personal jewellery, my mother's diamonds, precious stones from the treasury. I opened my eyes and you had become the queen of the Arya race, wife of King Yayati. And I, I was your slave. My eyes have no lids now. I live staring at you unflinchingly like the fish. No, 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 like the gods. Oh no, more like a corpse. Its eyes wide open. As the king crawls into your bed night after night, I want you to remember I am there, hovering. You make me sick. Girish translated Yayati into English himself, but quite late, decades after he had written it, as he didn't think much of the play and considered it a part of his juvenilia. And in the decades between writing and translating Gayati, Girish translated all of his plays into English quite cheerfully and readily. Ah, but he came to translation accidentally and with some reluctance. The story is that Alec Padamsi wanted to do a production of Tughlaq in English and he asked Girish to translate the play and he refused several times. Alec was finally able to persuade him and as it turned out, in Alec's words, it is the finest play written by an Indian in English. Ramanujan's problem was, he translated in his usual poetic fashion, how these phrases, you know, he would have a Savitriya, then a Hendatiya, one of the, his wife's dried up peapod body, Pranesh Acharya lifted up and took something in some It's an odd beginning for an English uh, sentence. It catches the Kannada, uh, this, but he was not as great a master of the, the prose as he, did, he was of uh, poetry. He, you know, his method was definitely poetic, phrases. And this is why he, he offered to do Tughlaq and I said no. You see, the point is, particularly with plays, plays are spoken. And therefore, when you translate them, they have to be speakable. Shakespeare says that, to be or not to be, that's the question. It's n whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer, the slings and our arrows are outrageous, and pum, 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 it goes. But Shakespeare is bright enough to give you a breathing pause before a long sentence. You know, he is the re true master of theatrical language. To be or not to be, that's the question. Whether it's nobler than that. Now, can the translator get that? You know, this I'm giving you an easy example. You know, this rhythm where the actor can get the... It's very hard unless you have been on stage yourself. I have been on stage and used English in various ways. I was the president of the Oxford Union. And, you know, I've also been acted in plays. 
And the use of English is different in each case, actually. Because when you speak, like Oxford Union, you speak like Shashi Tharoor. I, I don't mean to condemn. For his purpose, that's what it is. You can see his capital letter at the beginning, the pause, the comma, and he ends. But that's not how you speak in a play. You know, Pinta is more your... The way you use language in a play has to be completely different. I think I mentioned it to you in that lecture, but you may not have this. Ramanujan had pointed out to that there are structurally rightward branching languages and leftward branching languages. Okay, a rightward branching language is English. He, he climbed a tree. He climbed a tree which had branches. He climbed a tree which has branches which had flowers. He climbed a tree which had branches which had colorful flowers. He climbed a tree which had colorful flowers which blossomed in uh, March. He climbed a tree. You know, you can extend it. Canada, you can't do that. He avano girayerda. Avano tongi ayid the girayerda. Who gade the tongi the ayid girayerda? However, you know, it, it extends in the leftward direction. You know, so that the punchline very often in English comes to the right end, while in Canada it has to come very often at the beginning. I'll give you an example. This is from a line from uh, uh, Tipu Sultan, where Lord Wellesley says, when his brother says, are you appointing your own brother as your secretary? Is it nepotism? So Lord Wellesley says, quite right. There is nothing more pernicious than nepotism, which is half-hearted. No, you can't do it in Canada, which is half-hearted, comes first in Canada. We spoke to him about how he felt about translating into English. We asked him what it was like for him to move his place from one language to another. Did he struggle to find words in English for what he had written in Canada? No less so. No less so because, you know, for what? I'm 80 years old. I got married at 30. So for 50 years, I've been talking, speaking in English to her, them, my children. So English comes naturally. I don't even you know, think about it. But initially, I used to think of different parts of my life in different languages. If I thought of Darwar, I would think of Konkani. If I th uh, thought of Oxford, which is English. And that thinking part is there. But as you, if you have to become a writer, you have to learn to think in that language. In that sense, Raghu has an advantage over me. You know, he thinks in only one language. I can't. I think. But my I have the advantage is that I have a range of associations. Every now and then, when I experience Girish's English, I'm struck by its uh, particularity. You know, it's it's beautiful, but it's strange. Will you read that bit from Nagamandla? You know, Naga's great love speech? Yeah, of course. Frogs croaking in the pelting rain, tortoises singing soundlessly in the dark, foxes, crabs, ants, rattlers, sharks, swallows, even the geese. The female begins to smell like the wet earth, and stung by her smell, the king cobra starts searching for his queen. The tiger bellows for his mate, when the flame of the forest blossoms into a fountain of red, and the earth cracks open at the touch of the aerial roots of the banyan, it moves in the hollow of the cottonwood, in the flow of the estuary, in the dark limestone caves, from the womb of the heavens to the dark netherworlds. You can see the local references, no? The banyan tree, the tiger, the flame of the forest. But what does it mean for tortoises to be singing soundlessly in the dark? Where are these images coming from? You did not what we're used to in English, yeah? But they have a power. I mean, they're alien. And fresh. Oh, completely fresh. And I think that's why they are powerful, because, you know, he's actually pulling these things from different languages and cultures and pushing our boundaries to imagine something new. Here is a man who's speaking and reading across languages, Marathi, Konkani, Kannada, English. 
That's why I don't think he's a Kannada writer. Oh, do not say that. I said it once, yeah, long ago in, in the 90s. I said, you know, Karnad is not a Kannada writer. He's a writer who writes in Kannada. He was so angry he didn't speak to me for such a long time. But I think it's important to note that he represents a generation of multilingual writers and thinkers in India. And they don't make them like that anymore. Nobody did my first play. So I said to myself, oh God, no one does my plays anyway. So what does it matter? So let me write a grand play, thinking no one would touch it. That was Tugla. Okay, I thought no one will touch a play with some 40 characters. As it happened, it was done within six months and has been continuously done. I don't even keep track of it now. It was initially the first copy was called Between Two Kingdoms. Because, you know, one was in those days existentialist, you know, two kingdoms, Delhi, Daulatabad. But increasingly, it became difficult for people to say between two kingdoms and it got shrank to Tughlaq. Look at that theatrical ambition. When he fails, he goes even bigger. But you know what's really interesting about the going bigger, as you say? There's nothing theatrical about Yayati. And so Girish writes Tughlaq and he actually discovers the magic of theatre. What does it mean to put something on stage? It doesn't have to have 40 characters, but it does have to have drama. And I believe that he discovered that in Tughlaq. In, you know, in a way that Yayati is actually just a work in progress. In Yayati, all the drama is in the words, but in Tughlaq, it's in the action. Exactly. You got to see the guy getting murdered. Here is an excerpt from the middle of Tughlaq, which was published in English in 1972. Preetam Koyal Pillay reads the part of Tughlaq and Kafil Jafri plays the young soldier on duty. If you stay here long enough, you'll anyway learn to ooze spittle before everyone. Be yourself at least until then. How old are you? Nineteen, Your Majesty. <laughs> Nineteen? That's a nice age. An age when you think you can clasp the whole world in your palm like a rare diamond. I was twenty-one when I came to Dalatabad first and built this fort. I supervised the placing of every brick in it and I said to myself, one day I shall build my own history like this, brick by brick. You know, one night I was standing on the ramparts of the old fort here and there was a torch near me flapping its wild wings and scattering golden feathers on everything in sight. And there was a half-built gate nearby trying to contain the sky within its cleft. And suddenly, something happened, as though someone had cast a spell. The torch, the gate, the fort, the sky, all melted and merged and flowed in my bloodstream with the darkness of night. The moment shed its symbols, its questions and answers, and stood naked and calm where the stars throbbed in my veins. I was the earth, the grass, the smoke, the sky. And suddenly a sentry called from afar, attention, attention. And the half-burnt torch and the half-built gate fell apart. No, young man, I don't envy you your youth. All that you have to face and suffer is still ahead of you. Look at me. I have searched for that moment since then, and here I am still searching for it. But in the last four years, I have seen only the woods clinging to the earth. I have heard only the howl of wild wolves in the answering bay of street dogs. 
another 20 years and you'll be as old as me. And I might be lying under those trees there by then. Do you think you'll remember me then? You see, after I'd written Yeyati, I didn't know what to do, what to write. It had got published, it had got good reviews. My, I had a publisher who was after me, a good publisher, who was still my publisher, Manohar Granthamalu. And they kept saying, give us another play, another play. And I didn't know what to do. So what I did is, the Manohar Granthamalu had published a book, a triple book, three volume, on the history of Kannada literature. Okay, history of Kannada literature going back to the 60s. And I took them to Oxford. Okay. And on the way to Oxford and in Oxford, I read the It was written by some, a critic called uh, Kirtinath Kurtkoti, okay, who had taken a panoramic view of Kannada literature. And in that he had said that we have nothing to replace. This is where dissatisfaction with the Puranic started. He said we have got Puranic plays, but they are all about gods and, you know, there is no, there is a, we have not a play that can compare with the examples he gave are interesting with Caesar and Cleopatra. You know, and something like that. Some we have not used our history. We only have costume plays. You know, Shah Jahan looking at Taj Mahal and crying. That kind of thing. So I said, why not? So again, this has been a method. I'm very meticulously I sit down and work like I did for my interview. I, I really work and, you know, make notes on. So, I was at Oxford. I went to India, what used to be called, I think, India House. I took out an elementary book of history, started with Mohenjo-Dar, and started it. Where is a good subject? Came to Mohenjo-Dar, Ashoka was a cliche, there was, you know, Shahjan, all this sort of, went through it. Until I came to Tughlaq. You know, I was reading it. And I said, mad Tughlaq. God, marvelous, you know, because of existentialism and so on. Madness was in the air. So, and I was about 22, 20, no, 23, 24. Mad, so mad. So, I wrote this play. Once I was obsessed with Tughlaq, that was it. Then, you know, for, for about two or years, I was... I read everything about Tughlaq. I read Burney. I read the history of Corona Turk. That's the way I work. I mean, you know. So, I mean, you know, then I found him very fascinating. In fact, now, of, uh, now when I read about Tughlaq, I, I'm glad I didn't read more. Because I would have made him wishy-washy. You know, I just got enough to make a dramatic thing. Uh. So, I love this. What he's saying here. You don't have to know everything about your characters but you have to know just enough to make them real on the stage. Girish is showing us how to create a dramatic character. And you do that not by knowing everything, but by picking a personality trait um, and fleshing it out so that it becomes the crux of the play. So, for example, Tughlaq might have spoken the language of birds, or he could have been a fantastic horseman. But Girish is not interested in that. What Girish finds relevant is Tughlaq's determination to change the world into which he was born, right? And he takes that trait, and the play grows out of it. You see, at some point, halfway through, I suddenly decided that if I have to go in search of subjects, you know, as I told you yesterday, they don't come easily to me. I, I have to look for them. I, at Tughlaq, I look for a history thing. Oh, and, uh, you know, and so on and so on. Then, let me see the lacuna in our tradition and try to fill it up. So, I went, I said, Puranic play. Now, what do I mean by Puranic play? Let me go, not to Rama and Krishna, but let me go to fire and the rain. You know, that kind of thing. I said, I must enrich my tradition by writing plays. Since I'm not obsessed with any particular theme, and I have this ability, which Ramanujan had, to become 
uh, obsessed but choosing a subject you know you take a subject and go into it enormously and take you into it i imbibed that from him and you know taking folk tales and so on all that i took from ramanuja because he made that available and so ultimately what happens is if you are doing a his history play in canada the first play you think of i'm sorry to say is tugla okay you may say you want to don't want to do a traditional thing then you think of tipu sultan okay now this uh, you know tell it to you if you think of a pauranic play you know immediately again you know this, this kind of so you are the emetic but particularly folklore you know you go to ghayavadana you go to it, these were these have become the standard works because partly also because people don't have imagination i set up the models <laughs> that's funny yeah modest as always is our girish but you know it's true he did set up the models but anyway the lack of modesty is not the point what we have to remark upon is how hard he worked to write those plays he spent decades working on some of them you know fire in the rain crossing to dalikota absolutely it's striking that he almost went genre by genre be it mythological historical folk or what we might call social dramas and he was determined to write the best play in each of those genres and he covered a time span from vedas in the fire and the rain to 21st century bangalore in boiled beans on toast but to me as i said the play that is not really successful at all is bali definitely it's not as good as it should have been i think i think it's very really feeble as a play you know it's not working that's so you write and write and write when agni mat mare and so on however hard it took i knew that i was getting somewhere one day it will the two plays which are most exasperating is that one and the third one is anjumale which i never found satisfactory at all some hurts that incestuous relationship just in ultimately you like a play when it is successfully done and liked by the audience that's what you write it for it doesn't matter Play is everything to be performed, but it's a theatre cliche, no? That a play lives not on the page but on the stage, and so I wonder what Giri should have thought of these years, these last two years of dark stages. You know, what does it mean to be a playwright when you can't see your work being brought to life? I also find it striking that strange reversal where he talks about knowing when a play is working to finally saying it's the audience that decides. is he saying that even if he thinks it's a bad play and it's successful with the audiences then that's a great play what do you think he's saying there i hope he's not saying that but you know he said to us so often that he was never happy with bali he just felt it wasn't working and apparently actually audiences don't like it either let's go to this bit from bali which was first published in canada in 1980 but significantly revised and published in english in 2004 Sachin Gurjale and Iravati Karnik read the parts of the king and the queen respectively. Now she'll have a grandchild instead. Look, we can't change her. I can't get myself another mother she can't get herself another son and I won't look for another wife so that seems to be a fairly unalterable situation I wish you would stop being so full of doubts about yourself people don't dislike you she does and I can't blame her because of me you deserted her faith her mother goddess I'm afraid of what that bit of the thatched roof there you've considerately built a wall around it to hide the shed but the the roof shows as though it refuses to be dismissed the earth there couldn't take a higher wall it's the shed in which your mother keeps her animals all these years 
I've been pretending that it doesn't exist, that, that I couldn't hear the bleat of sheep being taken out at night for slaughter. You sleep through it. You've grown up with those sounds. I haven't. They often wake me up, keep me awake. But I've pretended I didn't mind. I know. I'm sorry. Because I didn't want to hurt your mother. Why are you bringing it up now? When your mother says she'll celebrate, what does she mean? Darling, how does it concern us? She doesn't make any demands on us. The animals are graded according to the occasion. Poultry is offered at daily rites, sheep, goats for the more important rituals, then buffalo. You know that's been the family tradition. Weren't human beings also offered in sacrifice to the goddess once? Yes, but that was generations ago. Yes, so you see, a tradition can be given up or at least changed. Mother will not agree to give up her practices. You know that. She feels she owes it to our ancestors. We've been through all this before. But now it concerns our child. What offerings will be considered worthy of a royal birth, do you think? They say when you were born, every inch of the earth for miles around was soaked in blood. People exaggerate. Yes, you're right. I shouldn't be complaining about the scale. Just the thought of bloodshed, even a single drop of blood. Do you think the play is feeble? I, I don't think that scene is feeble, but you know, there is something profoundly unsatisfying uh, about the end of the play. When it was produced in, in England in 2002, one of the reviewers at the time says, this is a play that loses confidence in itself. I think that's a great line, loses confidence in itself. But what does it mean? <laughs> I think even the reviewer was not quite able to put their finger on what is wrong with the play. Do you think the play loses confidence in itself? Well, uh, I think that Bali is dealing with a really important question for our society. This is after all the challenge that Buddhism and Jainism put to Vedic religions. What does it mean to use ritual violence as a substitute for actual violence? And this question becomes even more critical for a king whose job involves violence. To me, it's obvious that as the women, the mother and the queen, keep raising the stakes, they take these clear stances, the king is unable to come up with an answer. But the king is the one who has to answer the question, right? You know, the women are like, I like violence, I don't like violence. But the king, his problem is how do I deal with violence itself? And you know, because the king doesn't have the answer, maybe it's an indication that Girish doesn't have the answer. Bali would have worked, like Hayavadana works, where Girish also deals with big philosophical questions. But in Hayavadana, Girish gives us an answer. It may not be the right answer, but it is an answer. And he gives it to us dramatically. That gives the play momentum. And it leads to a fuller narrative and a proper dramatic arc. It was performed in um, Leicester and all, no? Bali had to be present outside. That is a mistake, though. You see, what happened is when I had landed in England, there was this, uh, you and I do, she was the artistic director of Leicester Theatre. And she wanted to prove that she could get an Indian playwright to write from them. And she said to me, write. But I can't write, just sit down and write. And the only text I had was Bali, which I said was okay for the Really what I should have written for Lester was something like wedding album. You know, Indian family, the daughter getting married, the son, you know, the real television uh, tearjerker, but in a, also a different way. Then I would have been a huge success in uh, England, but instead of that I wrote this play. And it meant nothing to the uh, Indian audience. It's a question of time and space. And, uh, and even in England, there are workshops for Indian playwrights. You know, Tonika Gupta in the waiting room. I saw Tonika Gupta with the uh, Shabha Nazmi in it. The audience is baffled. They don't know what's happened. Because it's all written for 
an elite audience. So here are these Indian, later on I realized, an Indian playwright living in London, she should go to the Bangladeshi market, sit there for two days, she will get any amount of raw material. It is too late for me. You have to be in the audience. You know, ultimately that is the test of a play. Has it worked for the audience you wrote it for? You see, with my, my, the great thing I learned in England, in London, is at the end of it, I didn't want to write for London. After that, I wrote Wedding Album and uh, Ben the Carlo on Toast, and I wrote uh, Crossing to Tarekota. I realized that this is my audience. If the play works here, this is it. You cannot sit here and hope to write a Macbeth. This is why all these sort of directors of the National Theatre come looking for an Indian play, they can do that. It's doomed to failure. You cannot find an Indian writer sitting in India who will write a play that's appropriate for an English audience. He must belong to that society. You have been listening to The River Has No Fear of Memories, a series of conversations with Girish Karnad. We thank the Nilekani Philanthropies for supporting this series, Pallavi MD and Konarak Reddy for the original music, Gokul Abhishek, Gaurav Krishna and the Bangalore Studio for sound recording and engineering. At the Bangalore International Centre, our thanks to Lekha Naidu, Raghu Tenkaila, Saraswati MP, S. Sarvanna Raj, Rajashekhar B.N., Manas Sampath, and of course, V. Ravi Chandar. Ajay Krishnan, Sunil Shanbag, Vinod Ravindran, and Vivek Madan, thank you for being there when we needed you. Thank you also, Vivek Shanbag and Shanta Gokhale. Our special thanks to the Karnad family. Anmol Tiku and myself, Arshia Satar, have put these episodes together from conversations that we had with Girish Karnad in June 2019. <laughs>